Okay, well, good evening, everybody. Yes, uh, it's a bit, a bit surreal not being able to see everyone in front of me. This is the first time I've done a webinar of this kind. Um, but um, Julie very kindly asked me to give a bit of an update to everybody. Um, we've run a couple of conferences over the last four or five years, and um, you know we're really um, conscious that not everyone can come to the conferences. We want to be able to move those conferences around the world to give people more access but um, it can be a little bit isolating sometimes and uh, we wanted to give you a bit of a, a, a flavour and overview of, um, of Barter's um, journey uh, for, the, for the next few months and years <clears throat> and, um, and certainly from uh, Julie's perspective we, we want to work closely uh, to support her in uh, her endeavours for the um, units of competency that uh, we think are really really useful and a good way forward so I'm going to focus on two things this evening. Firstly, uh, animals as a crosscutter, uh, and secondly, thinking about how we might develop best practices. And this idea that um, animals are a crosscutter it was a term used by a vet in America, uh, which really nicely sums up uh, the way that we've been thinking about this over the last few months and years. And um, let's just uh, click on that bit. Here we go. So, in the emergency services, we often have uh, a lot of operational guidance which are relevant to the subject areas and the skills that we have and here we have things like pump operating and confined space and firefighting skills and you know equally you can see animal rescue as a skill set sitting uh, alongside those manuals uh, in in isolation um, we also have a lot of operational guidance which talks about the hazards and environments that we're going to be working in and encounter. And um, here we have you know, a couple of uh, rural related um, guidance documents and policies, animal rescue, farms, rural areas. Uh, and in here you would quite conceivably expect to see reference to animals. And uh, over the last few years, you know, within our animal rescue awareness presentations, you know, a lot of that reflects the nature of, um, of the jobs that we're going to go to in those rural areas and people would expect to, to encounter animals. But this doesn't follow through with some of the other subject areas. And when we think about fires in buildings, whether they're domestic residences, whether they're in this case high rise buildings um, or commercial premises, you know, I don't think anyone's really factored in the animal component when writing any of these policies. And this is our, our thoughts around the cross cutter environment where animals cut across all disciplines and all environments and all situations that we as emergency responders are likely uh, to encounter. So um, this is really quite critical. And um, we then think about some of the wider, uh, more major situations such as floodings, wildfires and so forth where we know animals play a major part and they have a big component within those those situations both for instant management and for for rescue and for the people that are involved as well but um, certainly in our case in the united kingdom if we took flooding for instance there's reference in the flooding documents to the potential for animals to be present but there's very little in regard to how we're going to tackle those animal issues, what skill sets are required in order to carry them out effectively, how they impact on the instant management and the logistical side of that, of that scenario. So there are, there's a, a huge amount of potential here for looking at the different components that animals will be part of and thinking about the skills uh, that we would need in order to effectively deal with them. And the other thing is in criminal activities, there's a huge um, problem in the UK at the moment with uh, status dogs. Hoodlums these days, um, rather than knives and, and guns, are, are often using um, dogs as, as guarding um, animals and some of them are trained specifically to uh, attack people in uniform, which is not particularly uh, friendly to the firefighter that's trying to go into a house and uh, put a fire out or to a paramedic that's seeing to a, a patient or a casualty. So again, another example of an operational risk that we might encounter that we need to be better prepared for. And uh, the conference in California last year, we, we discussed this idea that um, if 50 or in some cases 60% or more of the population have pets, then 
that potentially gives us a 50 50 chance of bumping into an, an animal or encountering an animal every time we respond to an emergency and so we want to better equip our crews uh, that are not necessarily in, in uh, the animal rescue sphere we want to better equip them to deal with these these risks that they're going to encounter uh, uh, a couple of years ago now in the UK, we launched the National Occupational Standards and uh, those were around two things. Firstly, planning for incidents involving animals and secondly, for responding to incidents involving animals. Just this last year, we've launched National Occupational Guidance and this guidance will really help strategic uh, managers to be able to look at their risks and determine where animals fit into those risk profiles and what training might they need to give to their crews. And this isn't just about the fire service, this is about all agencies that encounter uh, animals in the course of their duties. Going back to the, um, the NOS, uh, planning for instances involving animals, well this is about thinking from strategic manager level about the risks to their organization, the risks to their personnel, right down to on the ground, uh, the firefighters in their local area, thinking about what animal risks they have on their fire grounds and thinking about how uh, we might address those risks and what specific resources and skills might be required in order to counter them. So these documents are really, really important because they they highlight uh, that animals um, need to be considered in the same way that we would hazardous materials. And we need to think about where we will encounter them and you know, whether we have the, the, the right skills in place at the moment, whether we have a robust um, response to these situations to support our crews and to the public. So any organization that's thinking about creating or having animal rescue training or thinking about the risks that animals pose to their, their crews, they need to think about what their rationale is, what their mission is, what their role is. And this was quite interesting. We trained um, the United Kingdom's traffic officers, Highways England traffic officers that patrol the motorways. Uh, they deal with around 4,000 animal incidents every year. Uh, animals uh, on the network shut down the network, they cause major uh, hold-ups and the cost to the economy is around eight and a half to nine million pounds every year and so they need to understand well what their, what their job is, what their role is and then how they're involved with incidents involving animals and how uh, they're going to be faced with hazards or whether they're going to be faced with uh, a situation that they need to resolve or resource to resolve. So once they've gone through this kind of planning process where they've thought about what their role is, they've thought about the risks that they're going to encounter, then they can start to create a role descriptor uh, and they can think about the training and the equipment and the knowledge that their particular teams are going to need to have in order to perform their, their role. And um, that role may be limited in scope depending on the numbers of people they've got, the amount of training they've had, or in fact what they're, what they're mission is in the first place because if their primary role is to protect the public and to get the traffic flowing with the limited amount of people that they have there they may not be able to undertake rescue for instance they may not be able to facilitate rounding up large volumes of animals so they need to fit seamlessly into the resolution of that incident but they need to know who's going to come and support them and those organizations need to be fully prepared for that role as well. Managing risk is um, really something that we do every day with animal rescue or animal incidents. And in Hampshire, <coughs> excuse me, where I'm operationally an animal rescue tactical advisor, um, we we don't send a, a full predetermined attendance to every rescue because every incident is going to be different. And we need to go through a process of elimination and um, think about some of the things that you can see in front of you now. So firstly, what is it? What What is the animal that's involved with the situation? Because if it's a domestic, commercial, wild or exotic animal, that's going to have a bearing on the skill sets required perhaps to um, resolve it. 
That doesn't give us sufficient information about the incident to be able to mobilize at that point. We need to think about what's happened to that animal because <clears throat> there are a variety of different things that happen to animals which would require different weights of, of response. So its life may be at risk, um, it may be trapped, it may be marooned somewhere, uh, it may be loose and then we couple that with the type of animal and we start to build the picture. The environment surrounding it is really essential to know because something in an innocuous area uh, may need very few resources to resolve, whereas if the environment surrounding it poses additional risks or the people that are involved um, pose diff different risks, then of course we need to resource it in a different way. And that leads me on to really an important aspect, what, what human involvement is there, because animal rescue or animal incidents are really impacted by the human uh, involvement and um, questions that we would want to ask who is there um, who are they and really importantly what are they doing and that will help us to understand whether we have um, a human at risk an animal at risk maybe both at risk or whether this is purely an animal welfare response and uh, our mandate for going um, is in several forms really it may be part of our responsibilities under the farm rescue services legislation uh, which means that we will go to save savable human life and we will also go to save savable savable property and on many occasions animals will fit into that category and the Animal Welfare Act again is something very important to us because uh, that means that we don't want suffering to continue unnecessarily and if we can alleviate suffering perhaps with our partner agencies then that is um, our duty to the community and so effectively would um, dictate our mobilizing to an incident and then of course you know there may be issues where a welfare or human welfare or animal welfare issue um, gives us a, a moral duty to to intervene but what we've done is we've gone through a process and we've determined the, the scale of the problem and the, the type of resources that we are going to send to that incident and in my case the only time we would send a full rescue team would be for a horse uh, that's trapped because we know that there's a significant chance of humans intervening and getting themselves hurt and we will throw the full weight of attack at it. Uh, if we have a regular animal livestock incident or a small animal entrapment and there are no, uh, no, there's no other information that would cause us concern, we would send a much reduced resource to that. But what we're sending is a resource that's fully trained and able to make the right decisions at that incident or even on the way to the instant, or even through communicating with people at the scene. So the primary role of the responder, I believe, is to identify hazards to human and animal. It's to control and mitigate risks to human and animal. We need to determine if rescue or, or evacuation or removal of an animal is required, because often that's not our first uh, port of call. Um, and if we are going to carry out a rescue, is that rescue viable? Uh, viable on the basis of animal welfare or viability uh, dictated by the safety of the scene um, and you know, the, the whole situation uh, taken into account. Once we've decided that we're going to carry out a rescue or we're going to attend, we need to make sure that our skills are commensurate with the, the job at hand, whether our organization has sufficient skills and attributes, uh, or it may be that we've been referred from another agency that has reached their ceiling uh, of skills and, uh, and they've just moved to another level and we've been brought in to, to support that. And then finally, our job is to rescue or facilitate the removal of animal or animals from a place of danger to a place of safety using the most humane and effective method. So those are, those are the key things that we as first responders uh, need to uh, have in place and understand and be able to facilitate. And if we look at some of the recent news events, I just went onto um, Hampshire's website and looked at the things that they had posted as, as important news events. We've got three incidents here. Firstly, we've got a barn fire where animals were involved. Secondly, we've got um, a horse that's stuck in a bog. Uh, and thirdly, we've got a dolphin which has become stranded in a creek. 
all three of those situations involve animals, um, but all three of those situations require different skill sets in order to undertake and may be attended by different members of the fire and rescue service, not necessarily by one specific core team that deal with animal incidents specifically. And during my time in California, uh, last year and indeed this year firefighters animal control officers police officers many different responders are out on strike teams dealing with wildfires and encountering animals animals are a big part of their their operational role they may not have seen them in the past as being a, a high hazard or a particularly big issue but as we raise the subject as we developed the training over there they suddenly realized how important animals were and how much they did actually affect uh, their everyday operations and so you know we were behind evacuated lines rounding up llamas um, and then we had fire crews that were uh, providing structure protection for domestic and uh, agricultural properties where animals were involved and they had to make tactical decisions in order to rescue those animals or remove them from a place of danger and they need also to have the skills to know where those animals are going to go uh, post rescue who's going to facilitate their ongoing welfare and needs and that's where this whole integration with the veterinary community comes in it's really exciting talking to julie about um, the units of competency and she's going to talk about those a little bit later and the way that um, you know, through your workplace safety and through uh, vocational skills, people are uh, beginning to look at workplaces, look at jobs and see how animals pose risk to people and to develop the specific skills that those people require to uh, to carry out their role and to deal with things that may go wrong. And, um, and this is a, a great visual example of you know, different scenarios, um, different levels of events, different types of situations where animals are involved directly or indirectly and, um, and the differences in response to, to some of those situations, the different needs, the different resources, the different skill sets and pre-planning. So I'm really excited about um, how that's evolving. In our world um, we have role descriptors that um, kind of classify our, our responders and um, this runs from a basic responder at AR1 level so all of our firefighters have this basic knowledge of hazards that they're likely to encounter what their initial actions should be and command considerations going back to the uh, notion that all that the people are going to be a really important factor in any animal incident. And then we have our advanced responder. These are the people that are actually trained in animal rescue techniques and animal handling and behavior. And those responders are the ones that are called out with this predetermined attendance. And they deal with the specific animal, large animal rescues led by an animal rescue team leader. Uh, and so, at a traditional large animal rescue, you're going to have the mixture of people and roles attending this incident, everything from your basic responder, first in attendance, to the people that can facilitate the rescue, or the tactical advisor that's going to come along and oversee it. But there's, there's other roles that these people um, could perform without needing to be large animal rescue specialists. And so, as an example, I believe that all agencies that have identified hazards associated with animals should give their staff a basic awareness of that incident or how animals may impact their operational decision making and how um, they're going to impact on their risks and their tactics. So if everyone starts from this basic level, then we can look at what other risks people might be exposed to. And so for instance, it may be a city fire station or an organization that deals often with small animal rescue that might want additional training on top of that basic core awareness which will enable them to deal with their specific needs so for instance let's say take a, a Southampton as, a, as an example Southampton City uh, we may have a, a number of small animal entrapment situations within the the uh, perambulation of the city and so it may be appropriate to equip all or some of those city station crews with some knowledge about dog behavior, cat behavior, 
uh, maybe uh, wild animals that they would encounter. We get a lot of deer that are stuck, for instance, in railings and gates. Um, it may be that we want to give them training in immediate emergency first aid care for pets that they encounter in house fires or road traffic collisions, for instance. It may be that they come across dangerous dogs or status dogs. And so we can start to build a package around their operational needs, which doesn't suddenly turn them into a large animal rescue team, but it allows them to deal effectively with the risks that they encounter or are sent to encounter in the course of their duties. And if a station may encounter large animals, let's say rural station, um, for instance, we have a station which has a, a large exotic farm and they have wild boar, they have bison, um, or sorry, buffalo. Um, and so it may be that that local crew who are going to be sent to any emergency that happens at that establishment may need to have further training purely on large animal handling and behavior. They may need to know about controlling those animals, containing them, evacuating them from different situations, maybe the buildings that are maybe on fire, pastures, dealing with loose animals, how to load them and unload them, um, considerations for chemical uh, capture or even euthanasia. So those are a set of skills that that particular fire crew or that range of fire crews in a, in a rural area dealing with rural incidents which have animals as part of their makeup, that's something that we may want to give to those people in addition to their basic understanding. So we're not talking about technical rescue now, we're just talking about dealing with operational risk. When it comes to large animal rescue, there could be a need for basic training for people, um, whether that's manual manipulation, uh, lifting of large animals, psychology and handling, it may be immediate emergency care, all of those things make up a basic package of dealing with the downed animal or the regular large animal situation. But then when we think about that animal as the cross cutter and we think about all of the different hazardous areas that we're going to potentially encounter animals, it may be, and I think, I think it's absolutely critical, that we start to develop modules specifically for those environments and for the teams that are going to be dealing with those animals. So water rescues, rescues from height, unstable ground, confined space, transportation, um, winching and trailer riding and helicopter rescues, all of these things are specific skill sets that we need to identify do we want our crews to be able to carry out those tasks? And if so, we need to give them a specific training uh, to be able to do that professionally. And I think that falls out of the scope of the basic understanding of manipulating the large animal or rescuing it from a ditch where we're only using very simple um, concepts and equipment. This, this moves us into a different realm here where we we're dealing with specific hazards and um, those would require significantly more training around those hazardous environments than perhaps our, our regular fire crews would, would need. And the tactical advisor has a really important role and um, this is more around managing incidents that will have a component, an animal component. And uh, for, for instance, we can think about big transport crashes, agricultural fires and wildfires, floodings, hurricanes, tornadoes. This takes it to a different realm. This is where animal rescue is not a specific little skill set to deal with a component of that rescue. This is about looking at the wider picture and how animals fit into that wider animal, uh, the instant management. And often that is going to be around the needs of the people uh, that have animals as well as the animals themselves. So this is another role which requires a different set of skills uh, which we're, we're looking at at the moment. The same for vets really. Uh, we've been training vets since 2008. This is evolving all the time and uh, we firmly believe that vets are, are a fundamental critical part of an animal incident and um, we want to ensure that the vet that's attending has the right skill sets in order to carry out their role uh, professionally and seamlessly in accordance with the, the incident management. So 
We've got at the moment training for veterinary students. We've got training for veterinary practitioners that have got more than six months experience in the field. And we're working on uh, developing the modules which will reflect those uh, being delivered within the emergency services so that we get that combined integrated approach to these situations. So that's really a, a, what I wanted to talk about in terms of the cross cutter. Animals cut across all disciplines all areas of our operational life. That is also reflected in Civvy Street as well. People that are dealing with events and shows or whether you work on a yard or you know whatever your uh, professional or voluntary role in any situation where animals are involved, we need to think about what happens when it goes wrong, what are our capabilities and does this fit seamlessly with the other resources from different agencies that we may need to call on to help us resolve this situation. Uh, you can't come up with a, a good management plan, for instance, involving animals, unless you've got all of the components in place. So that's our, our cross-cutter idea. And um, the other thing that I talked about in California was about international best practice. Now, I firmly believe that we're all on a journey together. Um, and what we don't want people to have to do is reinvent the wheel. We want people to learn together. We want people to play their part in driving this forward as quickly as possible. And there are a few key components that um, that I feel are important in our journey. Uh, firstly, that we build an engaged community. And the fact that you guys are all listening to me chantering on this evening uh, tells me that you are all very passionate about this. You have a vision. You want to be part of a vision. And uh, you want to be part of the community that drives this forward. So I'm really pleased to be able to talk to you this evening. Um, I have to say that really there are no experts in this field. I would not class myself as an expert in, in any shape or form. I, I may have been to over 500 large animal rescues, but every time the pager goes off, um, I, I just hope things go well because animal incidents are unpredictable. And um, I want to learn daily and each situation that I attend uh, um, teaches me and it also poses questions. And so I believe that if we have an engaged community from different walks of life and different disciplines, having different backgrounds and experiences, we can all draw on each other's knowledge and understanding and thoughts to uh, move this forward as quickly as we possibly can. So building community um, and keeping people in touch and connected for me is really important. This uh, is also got to be an altruistic approach. Uh, this is this is not about building businesses. This is re really about, you know, sharing. And, um, you know, obviously we need to have sustainability. And for some, um, there will be a commercial aspect to this. But I very much feel that um, this is a partnership between like minded people who all have a part to play. And that is going to give us safer rescues, it's going to improve animal welfare, and it's going to protect livelihoods. And I'm really passionate about, about all of those things, which are why that those are kind of on the strap line of, of Barter's um, vision. I think it's really healthy to have international principles for managing incidents involving animals. Uh, I don't think uh, um, there needs to be, we don't need to worry too much about some of the detail. I think it's principles and ethos and ways of working are really important. Whether someone's got a yellow strop guide or a brown strop guide or whether, it, you know, whatever. I, I don't think some of those things are necessarily important. Whilst it's nice and, and it's very seamless when you're working with other agencies to have the same equipment, I think it's important that we agree on international principles first and foremost. I think that's really important for the managing of these incidents, for the, the way that we um, rescue animals, the way that we deal with animals. Secondly, I think the, the management of the casualty um, also would really benefit from having international principles. This was a picture from the 2012 Olympics and I was really struck by the 38 vets from private practices that are normally working on their own. Um, they have their own kind of jurisdictions and territories and businesses but they came together with a common goal under a common uniform and they worked really really well together and that really um, encouraged me and that's part of what Barter's vision is that we can build a community of veterinarians 
projects uh, that are working for the common good across borders and supporting each other in many different ways uh, to, to resolve the situation, but also to support each other and to develop as we, as we progress. Learning and development is a really important aspect to this and um, can't stress enough um, how it's important that we strive for best practice all the time. And best practice uh, for BARTA is around stakeholder engagement. BARTA is a stakeholder group. We have the key veterinary associations, the key welfare associations and rescue organisations as part of that stakeholder body. And anything that we want to develop or want to in introduce needs to go through um, those different stakeholders to determine whether they believe that that is, at this point, best practice, fit for purpose, best safety practices, best for welfare. And that will change as we evolve and as we learn. And that goes back to that connected community, being able to feed back their experiences and their, um, their knowledge and understanding so that we can always strive to be the very best that we can. Research and development, again, I think the universities have a huge part to play in this. I'm really encouraged that uh, Professor Josh Slater, uh, who is the co-founder of BARTA, is moving to Melbourne. Um, it's going to be a big loss uh, for us here you know, on a, on a local level, um, on a day-to-day -day basis. But I think for collaboration and for you know, cohesiveness um, across continents, I think it's fantastic for Australia that Josh is going and I really would um, urge you to, to, to use that opportunity uh, while he's there to, to build your community and to and to join up um, with what we're doing across continents and uh, yeah that, I think that is a really positive thing. Just on that research and development this week um, I got together with Resquip who make the uh, the training horse mannequin and uh, we've been asking for uh, a mannequin and working with them to develop a mannequin for um, instance involving dogs. Uh, this is a, a big issue for us in the UK for many different agencies. Next week I'm meeting with our Coast Guard teams and um, we're proposing to start training Coast Guard teams who are uh, dealing with dogs that are over cliffs um, and uh, in order to train effectively we need Need the right training materials, equipment, and mannequins. And so, as you can see here, we've got our new um, dog mannequin, which has um, two different heads, so that we can demonstrate different behaviours and different response. And we're looking at uh, uh, different techniques for the situations that people are encountering. So that this is a, an ongoing project, and we're really pleased that the the mannequin is is going to be available very very shortly. And it's important that we we have a a mechanism for implementing uh, um, new development, new um, equipment and concepts. And that's why I think the community is a really effective way of doing that because it gives a conduit for new innovation and it also uh, gives strength to the, to the argument for integrating some of these things in, in people's organizations. So um, whether it's the development of the cow, whether it's head protectors, whether it's PPE for vets, you know, all of these things uh, we believe are, are just ongoing uh, important factors in this journey. And community education too, we've seen huge successes uh, and changes in people's behaviour on a local level at rescues through community education. We think it's really valuable. Um, we also believe that we need to be working very closely with colleges uh, and we're looking at providing um, vocational qualifications for grooms, for um, agricultural um, workers to deal effectively with the downed animal, for instance, uh, that they will encounter regularly, but perhaps at the moment don't have formal training or understanding of, of what might be best practice. So this is about cascading what we've learned through emergency situations into everyday uh, life where large animals are, are involved. So community education for daily activities or uh, for preparedness. And, um, and certainly in America, we see uh, a, a very different incident uh, if there is a level of preparedness within the community, because that's going to help our emergency responders to be more effective in their role as well. So five things then that um, I think are important 
um, just to, to close really, um, terminology, subject areas, training modules, equipment and education. Um, terminology, um, speaking to people from around the world, uh, many people want to have a, a kind of a set of, uh, of terms for things so that there's compatibility within the animal rescue community, but also across other communities. And uh, I refer to Josh here. Josh, uh, Professor Slater, has been working with us in the fire service for many, many years. And what he's done is he's learned our language. He's learned to be able to put um, his concepts into a language that we will understand. And it's important that we also learn the veterinary culture, veterinary terminology. Uh, and also, you know, when you've got firefighters or other agencies or responders that don't come from agricultural backgrounds, it's really important that they get to understand the, the people and the culture and um, the industries that they are going to be working with so that they can then talk the same language. Subject areas we've we've touched on a little bit. Um, I think it's important that we understand who who's receiving that subject and to what level. And I, we're creating a, a menu effect really, so that the ethos flows through everything that we do. But the different levels of training or the different um, relevance of training can be plucked uh, from a, a menu choice following that. Um, early understanding of what that organization's mission and role is and what their um, operational um, role will be and what level of training will then be dictated by their understanding of what their roles and what their risks are. So, you know, for instance, when it comes to something like water, you know, there, there will be a different, different range of people that will deal with instances involving water, but they need to have the right training for the role that they're going to perform. Uh, the modules, we're very conscious that um, time um, and duration and delivery are really important when it comes to training modules because when we're passionate about a subject there's there's a lot that we could we could unpack. There's uh, and really important that we look at this from an educational perspective and we ensure that we're not overburdening people with with training um, but equally we're not selling them short we're making sure that we've got a blended learning approach which is tailored to their needs their geographical um, spread um, and uh, and you know what technology that they've got available to them or, or what training they have available to them so this is really important that we build and tailor the training modules um, to meet the needs of the organization that we're delivering to and equipment, this is going to you know, continue to um, evolve, um, but I believe that having a toolbox of techniques based on scientific evidence and consensus of opinion is really important. So let's say harnesses, for instance, lots of people around the world have made harnesses. Going back to the research and development aspect, um, I want to look at equipment um, from a scientific perspective. Uh, and again, that goes back to the stakeholder engagement. Is it right for welfare? Is it right for safety? Is it fit for purpose? Does it fulfill the role? Um, and get that, that consensus from the, the um, relevant groups and organizations. But if we can have it properly tested and researched, and you know, as we move forward, always be developing equipment that follows those principles. And again, we just mentioned community education, helping others to help themselves, I think is really, really important um, as we develop the skills to help the, the responders. We also need to be looking wider at the communities that we're involved with and ensuring that they've got um, you know, the right education because prevention uh, is far better to then cure at the end of the day and in the fire and rescue service you know we concentrate heavily on prevention on education and in order to drive down incidents and to make sure that we're not actually required to use these specialist skills at all so thank you for your time this evening Judy uh, many thanks for everything that you're doing and for giving me the opportunity to feed back on on Barter's journey and um, yeah I'd uh, welcome mm. anyone's con uh, comments and questions <laughs>